believe. Our story begins in the port city of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. On May 12, 1947, William Peach Young and Lila Coolin Young appear before a Halifax judge. The case at hand, a $25,000 libel suit against the Montreal Standard Publishing Company for defamation. The Youngs took umbrage with an article published August 31, 1946 by the Montreal Standard by expose reporter Mavis Gallant. The full article headline read, Traders in Fear, Baby Farm Racket Still Lures Girls Who Are Afraid of Social Agencies. Although the Youngs set out to salvage their reputation in the public eye, something far more gruesome arose during the trial proceedings. Ideal Maternity Home was believed to have assisted in the delivery of thousands of childbirth and adoptions throughout its multiple decades of operation. Yet the question remained, what was the fate of the poor souls that were never adopted? By Lila's own admission, the children were buried in wooden butter boxes, crudely retrofitted to serve as a coffin. Rumors from local officials and townsfolk claimed that the property was host to hundreds of undocumented child burials. The home was adjacent to a nearby cemetery, close to the nearby rocky shores of the Atlantic Ocean, and the home's often active furnace drew further suspicion. What the public would later find out is that not only were these children buried in crude makeshift caskets, but some of the deceased had been served a mixture of only molasses and water, intended as a way to weed out the undesirable adoptions. These children have been named the Butterbox Babies by the Canadian media. This is their story. Lila Gladys Coolin was born in Fox Point, Nova Scotia on October 23, 1899 to parents Salem and Elizabeth Coolin, raised a member of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Her family came from Dutch heritage, but they'd been settled in Nova Scotia for four generations by the time of her birth. Lila was one of 12 children, and her father supported the massive brood through work as a fisherman and farmer. Not much is known about Lila's home life, but it is assumed that as a middle child in a family of 14, her role in the household was closer to that of a caregiver than a regular child. It's possible that this led Lila to her first career path, a school teacher. William Peach Young was born on January 11, 1898, to parents William Christopher and Mary Lorraine Peach, the second oldest of seven siblings. His family had immigrated from the English county of Kent to the small rail town of Union, Oregon, placed along the Oregon Trail. The family moved a considerable distance around 1906 to the Canadian maritime province of New Brunswick, where he would eventually cross paths with his future wife, Lila Coolin, in the nearby province of Nova Scotia. William began his career path by attending the Medical Evangelist College in 1923, combining his interests in the clergy and the field of medicine. The couple met during the year of 1924, Lila a schoolteacher in the rural community of Fox Harbor, Nova Scotia. William was traveling the south coast, providing care for the sick and frail, while also doubling as a makeshift missionary. Their faith aside, it seemed as if the two had enough in common to make them a quick match. William, 28, and Lila, 27, married in Toronto, Canada during the year of 1925, with William's brother, James Young, listed as a witness. William's listed profession at the time was a clergyman, 
as an unordained minister for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Lila was listed as a schoolteacher working in Fox Harbor. It wasn't long before Lila was pregnant with the first of her five children, William Salem. The reason why the couple decided to marry in Toronto, almost 1,500 kilometers from their home in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, isn't fully known. But it is likely that they were making a stop in Toronto before they continued west to the Windy City, Chicago, Illinois, where they attended school. William attended the National College of Chiropractic, while Lila enrolled at the National School of Obstetrics and Midwifery. Although no concrete proof exists, it is assumed that James Young tagged along with the couple since he made the journey all the way to Toronto. Their time in the U.S. was short-lived, and the Youngs returned to Nova Scotia in 1928, after they graduated, where they would open the Life and Health Sanitarium, operating out of their four-bedroom cottage. In no less than a year, Lila had began performing deliveries, and William and his brother, James, both began work at the facility. The sanatorium's apparent slogan was where the sick get well. The clip shown here is from a 1995 CBC made-for-TV adaptation of a 1992 novel on the subject, Butterbox Babies, Baby Sales, Baby Deaths, The Scandalous Story of the Ideal Maternity Home by Bette Cahill. During this time in the US and Canada, having children out of wedlock was seen as incredibly taboo, and programs for single mothers were nearly non-existent, especially in Nova Scotia. The combination of religious and societal pressure would make it a common occurrence for a family to disown their unmarried pregnant daughters completely, kicking them out and leaving them to fend for themselves. To make matters worse, the Great Depression would follow just a year after the opening of the facility in the autumn of 1929. The Life and Health Sanitarium would see its influx of patients take on a noticeable trend. Unwed mothers, expecting widows, and in some cases, extremely poor married couples that needed a place to safely birth their children. Lila took advantage of the boom and changed the facility's name completely to the ideal maternity home and sanitarium, a cheery and bright name for a place that was filled with horror, greed, and sadness. Halifax became a highly active port city after recovering from the harbor explosion of 1917, serving as a direct throughway to England. It was a frequent stopover for merchant sailors and navy men, leaving a plethora of unmarried expectant mothers in their wake. It's clear that the Youngs planned to cash in on the gap left by no public health options. One of the early newspaper ads that Lila took out read as follows. Ideal maternity, mother's refuge, also, department for girls, no publicity. Infant's home in connection. Right for literature. East Chester, Nova Scotia. A 1931 census listed William as a chiropractor, Lila as an obstetrician, and William's brother, James Young, who appeared to be still living with the family as a nurse. All three of them were listed as working at a private practice. No doubt, the ideal maternity home. The Youngs were cold-hearted and ruthless, and this was best demonstrated through their business practices. In order to be permitted entry, expectant mothers were forced to pay the entirety of the care up front, $500, around 9K in today's value. In 1921, the average Halifax wage earner would only make about 1100 for a full year of work. For single and destitute mothers, this was an impossible task. The home's fee would balloon as high as 5K during World War II. The Youngs were known to employ the use of extortion and blackmail of both the women and men's families who couldn't pay. For the mothers that had nothing to give after being pressed by the Youngs, they were then blessed with the opportunity to work off their debt as a cleaner, cook, or nanny. The Youngs no doubt 
compensated way below the average daily wage of $8, and it wasn't unheard of for mothers having to spend 18 months working at the maternity home to earn their freedom with their child. The fees didn't stop there. They charged $12 for diapers and baby care products, and $2 for babysitting per week if the mother was unwell or recovering. If your infant were to pass away, they would provide a funeral service for $20. The service itself involved a makeshift coffin from the nearby Le Havre Creamery, repurposing wooden delivery boxes, otherwise known as butter boxes. If a mother were unable to pay for funeral costs, the children were discarded in the maternity's incinerator, or allegedly handed off to a local fisherman who had tossed them into the Atlantic Ocean, for mothers that had the funds but ultimately did not want the burden of young motherhood, the home offered options. Abortions in Canada were very much illegal at the time, almost 40 years into the laws were reformed in 1969, but it was a poorly kept secret that the ideal maternity home offered the service. Another one of their later ads read as the following. Dame Gossip has sent many young lives to perdition after ruining them socially, that might have been bright stars in society and a power in the world of usefulness had they been shielded from gossip when they made a mistake. If the pregnancy had come to term and they found themselves unwilling, Lila offered the mothers the option of paying the home 300 more to see the child receive life-term care, a roundabout way of advertising their black market adoption services. Some mothers would have their children elsewhere, but use the home as an adoption agency. The cruel twist in this case was that these mothers were usually extorted an exorbitant amount of fees from the youngs, who knew their clientele were desperate and likely out of other options if they had come to the ideal maternity home. The Youngs saw a boom of adoptions from their patients and turned it into a lucrative business, offering adoptions for a reported $1 to $10,000 a child. The US adoption laws at the time forbid the adoption of children across religious backgrounds, and as a result, there was an acute shortage of Jewish children available for adoption in the northeastern United States. There were countless stories of families from New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts taking supposed vacations to the Canadian Maritime, only to return with a newborn child. The maternity home fabricated adoption papers when necessary to show one of the birth parents had possessed Jewish heritage. The ideal maternity home of East Chester, Nova Scotia appeared to have a robust operation during its height, and is estimated to have internationally trafficked between 800 to 1,500 children throughout its peak operating years. During this peak, they reported around 60,000 yearly from their care services income, but all the adoption revenue was kept secret. Some source estimates ballpark their earnings from 1937 to 1947 alone to be in the range of 3.5 million in today's currency. The Youngs reinvested their earnings back into the home, expanding the original property in 1933, with William and James Young conducting the renovations themselves. By the mid-30s, the Youngs had grown their reputation considerably and had made powerful friends with the political and social elite in Eastern Canada, many of which had been patients of the home due to its discretionary practices. Lila wasn't quick to forget these favors and would lean on her contacts in the near future when the government began to snoop around the home. More specifically, Public Health Minister Dr. Frank Roy Davis, who forced the Youngs to hire their first registered nurse in 1933. But more on that later. The Youngs were able to pay off their mortgage in 1939 and built their own home, a massive three-story house with nine bedrooms. 
the Youngs turned opportunity into a grotesque enterprise. At the time, they were referred to as the Baby Barons of East Chester. Only children of high stock were kept at the home for adoption, so any child with a disability, any child of color, or any child with a mild sickness was marked for death. Lila was even known to inspect children up for adoption, and any birthmark or unappealing mole was another cause for death. Lila's chosen method of disposing of the unwanted children was inarguably ghastly and cruel, cementing the Young's place in Canadian true crime history with the likes of Robert Picton and Carla Homolka. Lila would put the unwanted babies into a butter box, doubling as a manger and eventually a coffin. These children would be fed a mixture of only water and molasses, serving a death sentence in under two weeks. Lila was adamant of saving money and cutting unwanted costs, and any children that were not suitable for adoption were deemed superfluous. Glenn Shatford would testify to burying between 100 and 125 children during his time as a handyman at the ideal maternity home. He claimed he would bring them to a field owned by Lila's parents beside the Adventist Cemetery in Fox Point, Nova Scotia. One horrific instance he recalled from the April of 1938, an unnamed infant was left in a tool shed for five days before being taken for burial. The Young's treatment of their living patients wasn't much better. Countless instances of abuse have since been brought to light, and Lila's bedside manner was described as harsh, cold, and nearly sadistic. The average age of a patient was 17 years old, and Lila made it a point to assist in every birth she could. William was said to fall to his knees and pray to the Lord any time a child was born. One account that encapsulates the brutality and horrid conditions of the ideal maternity home was the death of Eva Nyforth and her infant child. After going through labor on February 6, 1936, both Nyforth and her child passed away during the process. On March 4, 1936, William and Lila Young were charged with two counts of manslaughter, brought upon by negligence and unsanitary conditions. After a three-day trial, they were acquitted due to a lack of evidence. It was the Young's word against the Nyforth family, who wasn't able to be present during the birth. Provincial pathologist Dr. Ralph Smith determined that Eva died from peritonitis and unsanitary birthing instruments, and the child had its scalp loosened, and the occupable bone, the bone at the base of the skull, had been snapped by the forceps. Despite this, the Young's testimonies were convincing enough to earn their freedom from the Nova Scotian court. In May 1936, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police enacted a policy to investigate each reported death at the home. Instigated by Dr. Frank Roy Davis following the trial, this of course failed to account for the greater issue of unreported deaths. It would take another nine years before officials were able to prove concrete evidence of neglect. Another account that summarizes the panic and trauma that occurred at the home was the labor of Violet Eisenhower on July 7th, 1940. During the midst of Violet's labor, the child was apparently born feet first, and Lila was thrown into a panic when she noticed the baby was choking on the umbilical cord. She fell to her knees and began to pray to the Lord. William was in the room at the time and stepped in to deliver the child, likely saving both of their lives. Despite the traumatic and painful labor, both Violet and her child, Faith Lutania, survived. Several days later, when Violet was due to go home, she was informed by Lila that her two-week-old daughter had died. Lila claimed the child had stopped breathing during the night. The body turned black and was unfit to be seen. The funeral proceeding was planned immediately. 
but Violet was too unwell to attend. Violet's mother had knit the child a pink dress for the funeral, but instead they were handed a butter box with the lid screwed tight. Her father and husband debated digging up the grave just to be able to see the child a single time. Violet couldn't believe it. She had nursed the child for 14 days and there was no signs of the supposed deathly illness. She heard rumors that a wealthy couple from Winnipeg had traveled to the home intending to adopt a girl. Violet recalls that Faith was the only female in the nursery at the time and she couldn't help but be suspicious. However, a young woman in 1940 had little to no agency and she had no way of finding out any proof if her daughter was sold. Violet never had another child, and her husband Sterling passed away at the age of 38. She was left with no photos or mementos aside from a misspelled birth certificate. Violet's story made headlines across the US and Canada in 1999 when she exhumed the body of her supposed child. After six months of tense waiting, the test came back as inconclusive. Her daughter was still somewhere out there. Writer Bette Cahill and Violet both believe that Faith was still alive somewhere, whether it was Winnipeg, New Jersey, or somewhere unknown. Violet would sadly pass away in January 2002 before ever finding her daughter. Her daughter, if alive, would be turning 84 this January in 2024. Before she passed, Violet bought an extra grave plot beside herself and her husband in Nova Scotia, with the hopes that her daughter might someday return. The Young's reputation began to crumble in the late 1930s after the overflow of incriminating stories filtering out of the home. Most of the social and political pull they had accumulated had been worn away, and they were even kicked out of the local Seventh-day Adventist church. The Youngs succeeded in skirting accusations and regulations, and it wasn't until 1945, when the Maternity Boarding House Act was amended, that they were forced to finally apply for a license, which they were denied. This amendment also forced homes to keep records of patients' names, ages, and addresses, and to have that information readily available for review by the Provincial Director of Child Welfare. It also forbid the advertisement of adoption services, which the Youngs dutifully ignored. By this time, Public Health Minister Dr. Frank Roy Davis had been circling the home for more than a decade, and whether it was a case of Lila getting lazy, Williams drinking catching up to him, or the Youngs believing themselves to be untouchable, child welfare inspectors finally caught some tangible proof of neglect. Pediatricians who inspected the home in August 1945 testified to its striking overcrowding, its fly and vermin-filled nurseries, and the malnourished children, with some of them weighing less than half the healthy weight of a newborn. By November 1945, they had their boarding home license revoked and were forced to conduct their adoptions out of the nearby New Brunswick. By this time, the Youngs had cultivated a reputation as black market baby smugglers, and their infamy grew. Coincidental timing saw the release of black market babies on December 15, 1945. A Hollywood movie with a strikingly similar plot about an alcoholic doctor and his wife that run an illegal adoption racket. The movie was based on an article originally posted in Women's Home Companion, and later reprinted in Reader's Digest. It's very possible one of the illegal rackets mentioned in this article was the ideal maternity home. U.S. immigration had begun to hear rumors of an operation funneling illegal adoptions to New Jersey, and after pulling that thread far enough, they discovered the ideal maternity home at the other end. Their second appearance in court saw them less successful than a decade prior, and they were found guilty of selling babies to four American couples. Lila had used her last moment in the public eye 
to make a spectacle of the proceedings, claiming the home to be a charitable and selfless part of the community. They were only handed a fine of $428.90, less than the entry fee of one patient. William would later be found guilty for perjury after the trial, and it seems as if their lies had begun to catch up with them. The Youngs announced the home would be closing following the 1946 trial, although it was still operating as of early 1947. Their adoption racket had become much more discreet, still funneling income to the now desperate Youngs. William's alcoholism reportedly grew worse during this time, and he engaged in several affairs with women working in the home. Lila was at the end of her rope when the expose article from the Montreal Standard came out. She decided to sue the paper $25,000 for libel, but that decision would be the final nail in the metaphorical coffin. Through the defense's cross-examination of Lila Young, she was asked about the handling of deceased children. It was here that the details of the lovely butter boxes were first mentioned. Lila bragged that these boxes were lined with satin and the children were handled with care. In reality, they were disposed in cheap pine boxes and left to be forgotten in an unmarked grave at the nearby cemetery. As for the children that survived, the trial revealed equally damning evidence of counterfeit adoption records and the falsifying of religious backgrounds and generally inhumane practices like separating twins or creating twins with two completely unrelated children. Finally, the horrid conditions of the home began to filter out. The rats, the swarming flies, the overpacked nurseries, and the underfed children. It was clear that the youngs were not only negligent, but unneedingly cruel. The Youngs would ultimately lose the libel suit. Under intense watch from government officials, they halted all activity out of the home. Their last ditch effort at generating income was to somehow convince mothers to travel across the border themselves with their newborns, which wasn't ultimately sustainable. After countless fines and charges for illegal adoption practices, they decided to shut down the home and announce they were opening a hotel in its place. The Youngs had ostracized themselves from the community, and it wasn't long before they had fallen into financial ruin. Now bankrupt and nearly ran out of town, the Youngs moved to quiet, rural Quebec, where William's family was from. The Youngs' children didn't make the move with them, and they went their separate ways across Sudbury, Ontario, and the United States. In 1962, the new owners of the massive property in East Chester, Nova Scotia, started renovations on the home. In the dead of night, a massive fire tore across the monstrous wooden home, burning it to the ground. Although the home was gone in the physical, its mark would not be soon forgotten. That same year, William died of cancer. Lila was diagnosed with leukemia in the late 60s and moved back to Fox Harbor, Nova Scotia in 1967, dying two years later at the age of 70. Fittingly, she was buried next to her family's property by the Adventist Cemetery, where rows and rows of Butterbox babies were laid to rest. Not all stories out of the ideal maternity home have resulted in heartbreak, and a growing community has developed of survivors from the home. Whether they are trying to retrace their own lineage or that of their families, countless stories have emerged of families claiming they believe they are distantly related to prominent Canadian politicians of the time, and DNA tests have backed up their claims. I even stumbled across a post by Violet Eisenhower's niece, searching for information on Faith Lutania, as recently as December 2002. So maybe hope isn't lost yet. 
the youngs are estimated to be responsible for 400 to 600 deaths between infant and adult patients, but the true number will never be known.